Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Josh and Jason Monday Christian and Conspiracy Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Monday. If you don't know me, I'm a Christian rapper, devoted husband, father, and army veteran. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host. He's a Christian, devoted husband and father, and my brother. What's going on, Jason? And you can add back to being a football coach again football for my coach. son's football team, <laughs> which is he's doing very well. And I'm very proud of him. And uh yeah, and welcome back, uh Jesse and Gary. You know, like Gary's been on a few times and uh, Jesse was on a few shows ago and she her, hers is doing really well on our on our feed. Like that's probably one of the best ones we had. Yeah, her and her and Gary both uh, come and on th- and crush it. So and thanks for the subs too, Jesse. That was pretty cool. They that was <laughs> that's like that's it's amazing. just like it's just like when Gary's on, same thing. A lot of people just help, just start subbing, and then when Jesse was on it, that happened as well. So I'll introduce the two before we go. Um where did I put your book? I just had your book in my hand. Um, <laughs> I need to grab your book. Okay, I don't have it on me right now. Okay, it's uh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> all right, so guys, what happened is I had to change diapers, I had to get bottles ready, everything. I had to run downstairs, so I think I left his book in the bathroom. So, anyways, all right, so his book is Genesis Six Conspiracy. He's been on a few shows. He's got a second book coming out. Um, I think he might have sent me the cover of that one. Um. Gary, your next book is going to be um, Genesis Six, part uh, Genesis Six Conspiracy, Part Two: How Understanding Prehistoric Giants Helps Define End Time Prophecy. So it is Part Two. I don't know when it's going to be out yet, but Gary, you can go ahead and introduce that, and also how they can find you and all that stuff. Yeah, so very excited about the book. A little disappointed it's taking so long in the publishing process. The editing side has just been a challenge with uh, the complications of the uh, of the manuscript. So, you know, editing the editor and then re-editing, and then it goes through what they call a tech edit now, and then that has to be redone. And now it's at the typesetting, and then we'll have to do some proofreading again after the typesetting to make sure because. It's uh, one not one of those easy books to to publish, but I think it's going to be easy to read and and uh, uh, will be a book that you can read independently independently of the first book, but we'll probably want you to read the first book. And same with reading the first book, it'll probably lead you to want to read the second book. So really looking forward to that. It's probably an October November release at this point in time. Uh, For people who are wanting to get information in terms of the firm pricing and release date, you can go to Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2 at gmail.com. That's Genesis 6 with the number 6, Part 2 with the number 2 at gmail.com. And you you don't even put anything on it. And I'll send you a notice uh, when I have that all firmed up. And I'm hopefully, I, I think I've got the price nailed down right now. I think we've got all of that figured out. And and uh, now it's just the exact release date and uh, that and then I will send the email out to you with all the information on where to buy it and how you can buy both books if you wanted both books and all the places it's going to be available. So, yeah, so pretty excited about that. It's been a lot more work over the summer than I thought, but that's what happens in this kind of business. So and uh, happy to be back on your podcast. Thank you so much. Every time you come on, it's such a blessing. You know, you always crush it. And we really appreciate your knowledge and all of your research. Um, Thank you, Gary. And um, next up, we have Jesse Sesapatar. Did I I pronounce that correctly, I hope? Uh, (laughs) Saboter. A Saboter. close. (laughs) Okay, hold on. Hold on. Saboter. I had it written down as Saboter. I'm so sorry. Okay. I always uh, booger up the name, but it's all good. Saboter. Okay, perfect. Um, You guys can find her at kingdom living with jesse.com if you guys want to check out her website um your your three books that you have is it his kingdom comes in power the anointing overflows in five minutes of grief with god that's the three yep. okay perfect yep. you guys please go check those out now gary and jesse come on here for free they just come out here to just share all the knowledge that they they have and and they and all the research they've done for free they're not charging us and uh guys if you could please at least you know go check out their books check out their websites they're here to you know, promote their books and at the same time, educate us on everything that they know. So please do us a favor. And then Jesse, if you could shout out anything else you'd like to shout out, please do before we start. No, well, I think that's good. I've got my new courses are released on my website, but they'll find all that on kingdomlivingwithjesse.com. I think the courses are Foundations of Kingdom Living, Rise of the Righteous and Beautifully Adorned. Yes. 
Okay, cool. That's why I had those other three. <laughs> Perfect. So guys, uh, we're going to uh, have a show right now actually on the Knights of Pythias and the Knights of Malta. And we want them to kind of go over all this stuff. I got to do some research of my own, but I know that they're more qualified than me to go over this. So we did have a show on Knights of Malta before, but it's kind of a small segment and we went into another secret society. So this is going to be more like putting a microscope on uh, on these two secret societies and um and we do appreciate you guys coming on jesse and gary so um if i don't know who'd want to start gary if you want to start gary or, or jesse it's up to you guys i don't know which one of you let's let jesse have the floor okay so knights of pythias yeah. we could start with that if you guys would like knights of pythias pythias um yeah <laughs> look at that too jeez and dude well i talk about you know kind of um, my specialty background is coming out of the Luciferian Brotherhood. So I talk from my childhood experience in, you know, the structure of the system, how it was built, how it was operating and is still operating today. Um, you know, I think it, our first show, we broke down the five departments of the system and we or we talked about the quadrant rule, the regional rule and then the five departments that um, that are kind of managing the system's assets within that regional rule. So, you know, in that you have the grand high priest or priestesses who are going to be ruling over quadrants. And then you're going to have regional rulers uh, who are going to be high priests and priestesses who will be governing over those five departments. So the Knights of Pythias were some of those groups that I learned that were kind of in that regional rule position, and they would work in conjunction um, with those five departments, which were, you know, the Masons, the Mormons, the Jesuit Catholic, the Kabbalah, and the Satanists. And usually, you know, kind of how the Knights of Pythias were seen were as lords or ladies of the land, and they would be connected directly uh, with plots of land that would either have, you know, large mansions, castles, or sometimes it could be museums, big libraries. And their job would be kind of to, you know, host, coordinate parties, especially like during the ritual seasons, they would uh, host the, what we call the sexual relics, uh, which, you know, would be sex magic with, you know, whether it's humans, demons, uh, beasts. So they would kind of be in charge of that. And they are considered, you know, being knights. They are part of uh, the governing military structure of the system, which is also going to include uh, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Bath, the Knights of Garter, and the Knights of the Thistle. Um, as we get into it further, a lot of those knights are also going to be accompanied with groups of women that are known as priestesses. Uh, the primary groups that are going to be with those knights of Pythias are going to be the priestesses of Delphi, uh, the priestesses of Melissa and Gaia, uh, the priestesses of Hectate and the Nile. Uh, you also will have select groups of Naphtali. Uh, the morning stars and the seraphical priestesses, depending on the country or the place that they come from. So that's kind of the basics. Um, you know, I'd like to hear what Gary has to share a little bit and then, you know, get into some of the other things about kind of their means of operation. But that was, yeah, that was amazing. That was awesome. Um, so those are probably, okay. So there's like lower level, like what they would call like the blue lodge, which would be like the page, the Esquire, the Knights, those are the ones that like, I'm not saying that it's the Blue Lodge, but it's similar to the Masons where it's just like that local, uh, you know, people doing these, you know, whatever they're, you know, you ask them what they're doing and we're, we're making turkeys for, for the poor and we're doing this. Um, are the people that you're talking about doing actual sex magic rituals and that are ruling over that, would that be like the higher, Dude, like they're the going to have, yeah, they're like going to the have their chancellors, duties. the Supreme their cultic past duties are going to be the sex magic and other things. And then the higher they, ups, right. Or, or is it the correct? Okay. But okay. they always will have their humanitarian efforts. Uh, usually they have three or four uh, ethics or morals that they'll define themselves by. So it could okay. be things like freedom, charity, uh, justice, uh, wisdom, 
yeah. knowledge, honor, uh, brotherhood, pick, like the real, yeah, about, like, like brotherhood. brotherhood. Okay. So it's usually based on whatever um, biblical story, or it could be another degree that they're um, that's connected to the brotherhood that they're defining themselves by. Okay, thank yeah. thank you for that. I just wanted what, to know. Uh, I got a question. Where where is it located? Where are the Knights of Pyth- Pythias all, located? Because I know where Malta is located. All across the United States, actually. Oh, uh, it's not it's not actual a place. It's 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 just a people or. It's a, yeah, it's a you can find them. You can find chapters or groups, um, of them all over the well, United maybe, States as well as internationally. Like fifty plus strong, actually. Well, where did they originate? Like, what's what country 18, they originate from? Out of the United States, like in oh, 18, really? okay. yeah, 1880. Yeah, they're they're uh, they're out of the United States. And what in Washington, DC is where they originate out of. Okay, Gary, let's let's have you come in and hmm. and uh and let us know what, what your information on these gentlemen are and women. Sorry, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it's it's a unique group, I think. Uh it's a lately Johnny Come Lately organization, if you can sort of put it that way, but Typically, those kind of organizations have been more underground or invisible, so to speak. Uh, and this seems to be a pseudo branch for the United States, uh, as opposed to not being false, but just sort of a junior offshoot, perhaps. So the name um, Pythias uh, is a Greek name, and it comes out of Greek mythology. And he has a run in with Dionys- Dionysus, and uh, he has a friend named Damon. And Damon probably would have been spelled Daemon in <laughs> like original demon. Greek. <laughs> like demon, yes, right? <laughs> the, root word, the root word for demon. For demon and I'm yeah. sure Pythias has something to do with serpents and pythons and things like that, which is typical in Greek mythology. And it's, a, it's an allegory story, no doubt about it. Uh, and it's about loyalty, and he has to, after being uh, uh, punished uh, and sentenced by Dionysus, he has to go on this quest, and he has to come back with something and uh, to be able to free his friend, and he goes through a shipwreck and everything. So it's a lo- this long sort of story, and it's a base story for a lot of other literature of the occult as it comes down through history so that's why you know there's more to the story than just uh the superficial story but that's where the name comes from and that's why there's that ideology of fraternity of the brotherhood type of thing and and for uh doing all good things for men and usually the platitudes that would go with that fraternal order so what's unique about this order is it comes about in 1864 in the civil war and this is the period of you know albert pike and um um and it's also a period of albert mackey two of the most famous sort of uh, masons at the time and in the south you have pike who is basically one of the sponsors to the new scottish right that's going to take the old york right into from three degrees into 33 degrees and what's interesting about this group of uh We'll call them Masons because they're kind of like a branch of the Masons. And in fact, their DC, Washington, DC Lodge in, in you know, up to a few decades ago, uh, they would have shared the main center lodge of the Masons in Washington. And they actually shared the mm-hmm. same building. And so you have that association. But they were established on the old York degree or the old mystical three degrees. So there's a couple structural differences there, although it's kind of, of just you know, sort of internal. Um, And what's also interesting is, is they were formed by a legislative act of Congress during the Civil War. Very interesting. And very, very unique that they would choose that period of time to create an order that's going to, at one time by the 1920s or so, it's going to have the most members of all the secret societies in the United States. And there's, I think there was some overflow that went into Canada, but not significant in terms of Canada for its representation. But Ontario would have been sort of well represented uh, within that organization. And it was an organization that was designed to have not only white people, 
but black people in it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, separate they have to though, be right? Invited. Weren't they, weren't well, they a separate? Not, not they... initially. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is you have to be invited to be into these organizations and you may still be considered too low bloodline or mundane to be considered to be elevated to adapthood through the mysteries, but you have to be invited. So you have to have some sort of bloodline. So now you're starting to ask yourself, okay, if they're going to have a significant amount of black people in preparation for what's going to happen after the civil war, because they're, they're the act of Congress is 1864. So the war is basically known to be almost one. Um, and so now they're going to start this new era afterwards. And so you're thinking that they're trying to figure out some of the slave ship documentations as to are there any bloodlines from Africa mm. that they want into this brotherhood. But this organization isn't going to play well with the Masons that include Albert Pike, because it's very yeah. much a racist Confederate organization, right? So they don't, <laughs> and by the 1870s, I think it's 1874, I might have that date wrong, but somewhere in the 1870s, it becomes clear they're not going to be able to work together. So you're going to have two separate orders. One's a white order and then one's a black order. I see. Yeah. And, and so this is an organization that seems to be working in parallel with the Masonic order. I don't see how they fit in or report up the ladder. I think they are just like a branch and they're set up exactly like Masonic orders for the most part and the same types of ideologies with the lodges and, and uh, um, <clears throat> regional offices and then a grand central council in Washington as well. So it just seems to be a, have been created for what was about to change in the U.S. and to be in control of that community that was now going to be free. And I'm talking about the slaves, of course, and that they wanted to be able to control those and establish their legal jurisdictions within the black towns, within any of the black government organizationals, organizations. And I, I know Jesse can talk at uh, length about how all of that is sort of set up. But I think that was why you had that organization created. But unfortunately, uh, you know, it didn't stay together. It had to be split. Uh, it's not nearly as popular as it once was, but then a lot of the secret societies are, are having difficulties drawing like they used to so uh, but i would i would suggest there's a deeper history within the old occult with this whole daemon pythias and dionysius or, or, um, uh, connection that goes back into greek history but i haven't been able to identify what's so important about that other than it's got an interesting little sort of moral to the story a fable to, to like die for your brother basically like that's kind of yeah that's, that's the way yeah. they'll explain it like that they love that part and justin h rathbone who was the founder was actually a freemason himself um that's that's interesting and and also you were talking about now louis armstrong the jazz and trumpeter singer with african-american jazz and trumpeter player um also franklin d roosevelt was also which is a president was part of the knights of uh, pithy uh let me say it right pythias uh and then also uh there was a, a few other uh presidents actually um it was franklin d roosevelt uh warren d Hardin, and william mac uh mckinney sorry and then some vice presidents as well were part of it and uh there's a whole list of people from u.s secretary of states to uh u.s senators u.s supreme court uh, a ton of people that were in um, government that, that were actually notable members. If you guys want to look it up, I mean, there's a ton of uh, Nel another one, Nelson A. Rockefeller. OK, so part of the Rockefellers, was, which is a vice president. I know Jesse and Gary could probably go over more about that um, if you want to take over, Jesse. Yeah, um, you know, to kind of go back a little bit, um, the important part that they played in society you know, is their job is to kind of be those regional coordinators and connectors. So, you know, like if you go into a city, uh, you can begin to look around, um, you know, they're, they're going to work in conjunction with all of those who are building up the structure, the buildings of those cities, 
Um, they're going to be the ones overseeing, making sure that everything is to brotherhood standards. So, you know, that was part of their job was to learn, you know, what is the standard? How how are members of the upper brotherhood supposed to, you know, come into a city and know where they go for things? Um, you know, who's the person that they're going to connect to? So you'll see a lot as you go into the cities, like let's just take... Um, I was recently in uh, San Antonio and um, as you go in there, you know, downtown along the river walk, which is really famous, you'll start to see a lot of signs, symbols, structures, things that are referring to the brotherhood being there. So, you know, one of the things that they would do is, um, you know, they would make sure that people in the city, if they were using ironwork, there are certain symbols that are utilized in that based on um you know what type of elemental magic is going to be used in certain activities and just by having a fence with certain ironwork there it's going to say who has to stand where who you know who's going to be in which position uh when they gather together um they also would use a lot of um you know do a lot with plants fountains waterways um they're going to make sure that the access to the spiritual gates um, are marked. And, you know, a lot of that would include working with the local government, uh, putting, you know, other Knights of Pythias into those local government positions so that when they need permits or other things, those things are in place. Uh, their other job is to make sure that, you know, every city is marked with certain sigils that show the, the authority and the jurisdiction um, within that system. So I do, I do courses on this um, called Land Assignment Coaching where I break down those symbols, uh, those sigils that they use. Uh, the first thing those sigils are gonna tell you on the outer layer is, is which demonic principalities have the authority in that area. Then as you get into the inner part of the symbol, like let's just say your city symbol, it's going to tell you which of those orders are prominent. Um, little details that we may not notice, you know, like there's some cities that will have two women, you know, they'll have the cornucopia in there. They may have the plow, um, you know, they may have a bunch of wheat. All of those are symbols within the brotherhood or the Masonic structure. And each of them have a very significant meaning. Um, you know, even the placement of the wording. Um, every city symbol, you will notice that there's, you know, wording above and there's wording below usually. And that actually represents the two main lodges that are gonna be in every, um, every area. And it will tell you whether the Northern Lodge or the Southern Lodge has more jurisdiction by the amount of space that the wording takes up above or below. So things that we would just not even think of that we would pass by and glance are all ways that they communicate. And, you know, the Knights of Pythias are very big on that, um, where they'll be working with universities, they'll be working with educational centers and local government to ensure that all those things for upper level brotherhood are there in every area. Wow. Oh. That's very interesting. I've never heard that before. That's very good for us to know. So when we're going through cities, we just, we can look at these signs, symbols, and kind of see, you know, and pray over this stuff and pray over people and, and try to, you know, rebuke these demonic uh, forces that they're trying to bring on us, you know, we're covered by Jesus, yeah. you know, which is amazing. So God has us, you know, but there's people that are not covered and we need to lead them to God so that they don't get involved in these organizations. And right now, <clears throat> this is why we we're doing this show is to expose the evil and try to lead people to God. You know, that's all four of our jobs here. Right. Um, lead people to, to Jesus and let you guys know that that is just not the way, you know, it talks about in the Bible, Jesus says not to swear oaths by anything, you know, not mm -hmm. to do rituals, not to do this type of stuff because you're, you're pledging to the enemy, you know, you're pledging to Satan. You're not pledging yeah. to God. So you can only have one master. It's either God or it's Satan, no matter if you're atheists or not, that's just the way it's going to work. But so this is very interesting stuff. Yeah. Some of the uh, organizations that the, 
the Pythian organizations is the Knights of Pythias of North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, and then there's Canada, Jason. And then uh, also there was uh, the Improved Order Knights of Pythias, so, which is the American branch. So there was a few different branches there, just to let you know, Jay, because you asked that question. I wanted to look at yeah, that. Yeah, uh, this is just, because like, <laughs> Pythias is not, from the it's not a word from the u.s so it's, it's greek crazy. like gary was talking yeah. about it's greek so that yeah. yeah so yeah it's it gets interesting and, and there was like i think there was like fifty thousand members at one time yeah over fifty thousand people actually um, in 2003 i don't know what it is now but oh well in the 1920s it was in the millions wow wow yeah so they're probably yeah. putting me together on the fifty thousand. <laughs> it's probably yeah. a lot bigger they're was, just probably putting that online yeah. you know <laughs> yeah I mean, that's a lot of that's a lot I'd of like numbers yeah, I'd like to put a little bit more stuff around what Jesse was saying, if 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 you please, let me. please do. Because um, uh, uh, so one of the things that I'll, and this was kind of neat was is uh, I was down in Orlando with Jesse at at a conference, and we bust out to a town, and Jesse was leading the the, and we went right into a an occult festival, and so and it was obviously an occult town, and she showed us how they laid things out in the quadrant that Jesse was talking about on the north end, and on the south end they'll have two government like buildings, and one was a Masonic call that we saw on the on I can't remember what the uh, the south one was, and then on the east and west you'd have two churches that they would have built, and they all have underground tunnels and things like that where they can do rituals and store things and do things in secrecy and also in that i mean they're claiming that within like the town square whatever size that square would be so again very uh, geometrically done from a masonic sort of perspective yep. and uh, that they would have a on the west side they would have a tree that was cut down generally an elm tree or an oak tree or an ash tree something like that that's sacred to them to do their rituals on, on the stump and it would be very close to the water source and of course jesse was able to find that and show that to us yeah, and the eastern on the they're eastern laying wall down with the stump yeah mm. yeah it was <laughs> on the eastern wall sorry okay and and uh, what's interesting is is that you have the same sort of layout in my own hometown uh, that wow. i was able to sort of ad ad identify with and they put their legal markings on there and those are the four gates that they're controlling by laying out that that square yeah. so and then she was talking about that they have ways to communicate uh, as to the invisible ones in terms of the hierarchy that oversees that town and that county and everything is done in, in, in the occult in both the visible and invisible realms in a very organized way. It's like the rebellious host, the Saba, the army, and it's all... Mm -hmm. Uh, comes under the government so when you look at psalm 82 you have the council of the gods and you have satan who sits atop that council of the gods uh, and then you have the 70 nations of the original nations well and those nations expanded and as they would expand they would send their people and their bloodline descendants that are sworn in these oaths and bloodlines to every part of the world to make these claims and they may be lower level bloodlines but they're still part of the bloodlines right and it's mm -hmm. all sort of interconnected and then you can imagine these gods you have 70 gods but then you have a hierarchy underneath them in their own throne room and then as these new dynasties and these new countries set up there would be a hierarchy below that that would link back sort of up the the uh, the model and so i mean it's so complex but by the time you get down to the local small town level it's just another branch of that sort of extension of that whole hierarchy so from a biblical perspective we can understand that because we're told about that that and in deuteronomy 32 it's the 70 nations and the 70 patriarchs that are in the table of nations in genesis 10 and first chronicles and also the 70 sons of Adam before the flood mm -hmm. that these yeah. gods reigned over. So even if those gods that went to the abyss, both before and after the flood, if they, and I believe they did go to the abyss both times, and you would have that rank and order 
uh, rise up. And so it's important to understand that they have a hierarchy of the angels, they have a hierarchy of the spurious offspring, and they have the offspring, uh, the hierarchy of the descendants that come down through the generations. And they track all of that through their uh, through their genealogies, their DNA tracking, their databases, their thalamic trees, and you know one is genealogical and one is for hierarchical order. Um, but it's all in place for them to continue to expand, and it's like millennia old. Now to bring back in what Josh was talking about about the Rockefellers and uh, the Carnegies and the Morgans and all the pseudo blue bloods of, of North America, uh, they're the stable of agents that were funded by the Rothschilds so that they got control over all of the banking, all of the major organizations uh, or corporations. Um, and that's why you have an important role that's going on when you start naming families like, um, um, you know, of, of, of democratic presidents, I think is some of the ones that you would have uh, uh, named with. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying well, like to think. Uh, talking about uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the McKinney's like Roosevelt. That, that's he the actually name, right? yeah. He actually joined while he was president. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And he was also a 33 degree Mason, if I'm not mistaken. So that's kind of, interesting he yeah so that, would, he that would have put him in yeah and so that would be interesting that he'd be 33 33 degree likely scottish right but if it's mm -hmm. in the old system i mean that's a whole different ball game so um <laughs> <laughs> in terms of high how how, yeah, level, how how high that level would be and jesse has a great knowledge on how high that hierarchy goes on the on the degree system so from how i, just from how I understand bit... it you know typically they'll they'll use kind of the degrees, um, they do go up to 33, but when they're talking about themselves, you know, it's like usually they go to the first three and then once you're a master Mason, you don't really consider yourself a Mason anymore. You don't usually use that term to define yourself. Uh, you begin to define yourself by your specialty degrees, which you can specialize in as many as you want. You know, you could be Order of the Phoenix, you could be Skull and Bones, you could be Rosicrucian. It just depends, you know, you're going to kind of pick a magic specialty, you know, white, gray, or black. And based on that, you're going to connect to the orders that uh, specialize in those types of forms of magic. Um, you know, for, for the main orders, like at the highest level, uh, those are usually the order of the golden dawn or the order of the phoenix the golden dawn is going to be more what's considered white magic the phoenix being more dark magic and then at the very top your order of melchizedek uh, which is the false um, priesthood based off the order of melchizedek in scripture um, but in that you know they begin to start define themselves like you know like if you think of a clock um you know, they're going to start going by degrees, but it's going to be like, you know, 15, 30, 60, 90, 180, and 360 is what's considered fully illuminated. So um, they begin to kind of put themselves into degrees of illumination versus, you know, they're not going to be like, I'm a 33rd degree Mason, you know, <laughs> they'd be, yeah. like most of them are going to be like, hey, my brother is like, you know, 60 degree and my uncle, he was a 90, but I'm a full 360. You know, that's what they're going to kind of mm. say. Interesting. Um, yeah. So guys, when we, when we read like Ephesians uh, 6, 12, like uh, for we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, and and when Paul says, therefore, take up the armor, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, all having done all to stand. What happens when we read that verse normally without understanding what, where Jesse and Gary are coming from or 
when we start learning that there's actually, you know, fallen angels and, and Satan ruling over these cities and demonic forces, that verse doesn't mean much to some people. They just read it and think, oh, that's probably just demons, you know, but we're talking about like he's Gary's talking about 70 lowercase G's and Jesse's talking about demonic forces and fallen angels ruling over cities and then regions and then states, and then countries, and we're not understanding that as Christians, because I think that pastors are kind of holding back on speaking of the spiritual aspect of stuff, and they're sticking with the grace and this this easy stuff to talk about, but this stuff is real, and we need to understand that, we need to open ourselves up and understand it's a spiritual battle in everything we do, even walking into a new city, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, not even just like you know, just visiting a new town, like Jesse's talking about, there's actually, there's people that are here praying over you, wanting you to fail as a Christian, wanting you to just, you know, fall to Satan's uh, wrath. Uh, you know, if you don't have your armor uh, on, ready to go, uh, study it up on the word, you're, you're going to be lost in the sauce. And we need to make sure we stick with this, with the word of God and understand that, you know, so this is vastly important. We, if we're Christians, we need to we need to listen. This is why it's just a Christian and conspiracy podcast, so that we show you both sides, and then you have you know the the Bible as your foundation, and then everything else is is going to be easy to you know go through. You'll you you won't be stuck in a rabbit hole because always we find out that that God and Jesus are are are, are the final straw. You know, but yeah. go, go ahead and I, keep going, guys. Sorry, I just had to. Yeah, I broke down. You know, I. I it's so important for us to understand that, you know, everything the enemy does is, is meant to directly, um, you know, remove the glory and the image of God from us. And God created us after his image, the sevenfold, the image of his Holy Spirit. When we think about that individually, you know, there's seven pieces to our armor. You have the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. You've got the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, and then your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, ironically, you know, that just so happens to be the exact same image that's used universally. You know, we have seven major planets. Uh, when you look at your community, what has the brotherhood done? Um, you know, they didn't go and, and build the structure on their own. By design, God created it that, you know, there would be churches in each area, that sevenfold church structure, um, you know, would, would govern um, each community, each area. So, you know, when you go in, um, I talk about how, you know, they have purposely built their Jesuit Catholic churches with a main one that's going to be where that helmet of salvation is supposed to be. That's the head spring of the living water. Uh, when they stop that up, um, they put, you know, the three main churches that they put into a triangle. That middle area is supposed to be your breastplate of righteousness. What do they do? You know, they put an underground catacomb there. They, they put a graveyard, have all three of those churches share a graveyard right where that righteousness is supposed to be. And all that flow of the Holy Spirit gets stopped up. It doesn't flow out like it's supposed to. Um, you know, without that flow of the Holy Spirit, those, the church that's supposed to focus on faith, you know, they're not building their, their faith. They're not building each other's faith and they're not building the other church's faith either. Uh, the churches that are supposed to focus on spiritual warfare, um, they're not focused on those things either. So it's interesting how everything that, you know, the enemy has taken, you know, really affects not just us individually, but it affects us collectively as the body of Christ. Amen to that. And Gary, did, did you have some more to add to, uh, to that? I, I do. And, um, you know, one, you know, we get a, a hierarchy of angels that comes down in sort of standard Christian doctrine where there's sort of three levels and, they don't really get it kind of in the right order, uh, I don't think. And I actually will show it in, in, in my new book, what I think the hierarchy is. And it's important to understand what the loyal hierarchy is because the fallen ones will counterfeit it in the same way. So just as God has a throne, Satan has a throne. So just as all of the high-ranking angels have thrones, 
that oversee the 70 nations and then the branch ones after they will all have throne thrones and they'll have similar they'll have hierarchies that go below them and the throne is shown in the bible as being on all four sides so we need to understand that that's going to be a counterfeit that's used in uh, the fallen ones as well so when we look at um the hierarchy is i would look at it from a simplistic sort of way you have uh the seraphim which are one set of watchers and this may all be replaced uh going forward into eternity because in in the book of revelation we don't get the four watchers separated as a group uh in fact you get three uh or you get the seraphim with the six wings combined with uh the the eyes of the ophanim um, and you also get uh, the description of the cherubim that's in in the image in in the book of Revelation. But here's the old old hierarchy that that Satan would be sort of working on and putting his throne above. So you have seraphim that are going to res be responsible for government and for religion, but in two separate sort of pillars that are coming down. And Jesse will know whether or not this lines up with what she was seeing on the other side. So uh, the seraphim at the top, and then you would have the powers as we would understand them. Although you have to be careful in the New Testament because it confuses powers with, uh, with another group as well. So there's two groups that are called powers, but they're individual. Um, but then you would have underneath that, the angels. And then in the religious side, you would have the principalities and the, and, and their messenger angels. And then you would have Michael looking after probably the archangel. I think Gab Gabrielle looks after the seraphim as we get that out of the book of, uh, of Enoch. Michael would be overseeing, um, the, the army side of it. And if there's a whole hierarchy of Masonic um hierarchy that's in the army so you have the army that's you know led by archangels and then you have mighties uh and you got two different groups of mighties that are in there and then you have the soldier angels right and then the last one is the thrones and so you've got the ophanium and the cherubim that i think work together but i could put those into a, another complete pillar as well but i think they kind of work together as as the complete throne and then you have the dominions and then their angels uh below them uh mm -hmm. so that's kind of the hierarchy that you would see things sort of built on earth and then as it comes down to the visible ones how they would set them up Very does that make sense yeah. to what you what you saw jesse um yeah very similar um a little bit I guess I wouldn't necessarily say differences because um, I think it just depends on how you kind of define, but you, you know, it's all kind of based off of, I'll say there's kind of two models that are used. Um, their, their Rosicrucian cross with the rose in it is kind of like their key or their breakdown, their universal um, understanding of how everything works as you look at that Rosicrucian cross, you know, why did they choose that? Um, they choose that cross symbol because that means in this sign we shall conquer. And they purposely use the cross because, you know, they want to mock Jesus Christ. But in that, um, when you start at the very core of that, you see that, you know, there's a center point and then you've got the four um you know, kind of like the four symbols, sometimes you'll see it more, you know, shown as like a square. And in that square, you've got four, four parts, four lines. Um, when you put two of those together, you know, if that middle part represents the Ark of the Covenant, you have the two seraphim with their wings around the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, from there, you know, you, you start to see layers. Um, you know, those two, when you put them together, then become four separate, which represent the archangels or the cherubim, or even some of the seraphim are seen in four as well, where, you know, you have the the cherubim that um, have the, or the seraphim, sorry, that have the four faces um, and, and are covered with eyes all around. 
uh, as you branch out, you know, on that Rosicrucian cross, you'll see 72 uh, symbols, each of those symbols representing, um, you know, that structure of, of the demonic powers. Um, you know, the, the 70 versus the 72 is because they include the double portions. Uh, there's two places in scripture where you get a double portion. So that's um, kind of the difference. And that's why Solomon, like in his uh, 72 keys, where he speaks about all the demonic um, hierarchy structures, the thrones and the the little G gods who sit on them, um, uses that number. And that's what the Rosicrucian cross is based off of. Uh, were the 72 that were revealed to him. So it, it is, you know, it's it, whether you call them powers, um, spiritual forces, authorities, that is the jurisdiction and the authority hierarchy, both within the demonic army, as well as you will always have, you know, both sides represented, uh, the enemy's kingdom, as well as the kingdom of God, because everything in the enemy's kingdom is just a mere image he can't create anything on his own. He has to replicate everything off of what God has created. Amen to that. Um, and the guys, we also have Psalms 82, uh, just to let you guys know. So if you are listening and you're like, gods, what are you talking about? So God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the lowercase G gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show parsley to the wicked? Uh, Salai, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are lowercase g gods and all of your children are, uh, and all of you are children of the most high, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, uh, for you shall inherit all nations. So, you guys got to understand that. And also God also took away the power of the other of little G gods in Egypt. Uh, so we got to understand that, you know, that this is real stuff that we're talking about. And um, this is not fairy tales. And as a Christian, we need to understand this type of stuff. It's important. Yeah, And in, uh, and in that passage where you said right at the beginning, where it's the council of the mighty, mighty goes back to the Hebrew word L as in an angel or a God. So it is specifically talking about those types of beings, but that's it's a rebellious council of gods. It's not the one that's depicted in Daniel, let's say 10, 8, 10, for example, or in the book of Revelation or other accounts. It's But it's a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. And he has a counterfeit congregation. It's a different Hebrew word for congregation there than it is in Isaiah 14 when Satan is trying to raise his um thrown into heaven to be like god you know on in 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 god's congregation and it's a different hebrew word there again so and if somebody was uh i was thinking i should probably should have when i talked about powers and uh the mighties uh the powers is excusia is the uh greek word and the mighties is broken into two one is dunamis which sometimes is translated as powers and then icarus which is in uh, the the mighty angels in the book of Revelation. So whether or not it's two different names for the same group, or there's two groups of mighty angels, but they're part of the army side as opposed to part of the uh, government side. The excusia mm. are part of. Interesting. All right. So yeah, I love how you bring some of that out. Um, like it was, I can't remember which show you first uh, were talking about it on. But you started bringing out how the, even the breakdown of the of their names, you know, so I'm just going to use an example, but it was like, you know, how you have that L meaning, you know, lowercase God that was, let's just say, like on as as a L and and really that, you know, that ending a in his name means a type. So it's like as as and then a a type of L lowercase God. And it was like, oh my gosh, like yeah. God clearly defined, you know, like when you uh -huh. even look at their and names that are presented in scripture, you know, they're clearly defined as a type of God, um, you know, with that lowercase G. <laughs> mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Like as, and as, as they're connected to 
two groups of Hebrew words. So uh, the first one is as in mighty, strong, and powerful, as in that mighty that they translated in Psalm 82. It also means stout. So if you're going to have that word that's used to describe the giants, it's because they had a height to width ratio that was two to one versus three to one. So they're quite mm -hmm. wide. And uh, it also goes down to AZ as as is linked back into EZ, which is now gets you into the goat words, which again mm -hmm. is also part of Azazel's name as he's described as the scapegoat that is um, listed in Levit Leviticus 16. It's the second goat of sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Some translations will say scapegoat it, mm -hmm. and other translations will say Azazel or Azazel, but scapegoat goes back to the Hebrew word Azazel. And it's interesting when you look at the goat gods like Baphomet or uh, Azazel or Bacchus or the pan gods, these are degraded watchers. And so Azazel wasn't originally a satyr. He was a watcher. He was one of these four groups, likely seraphim. And he was degraded to a devil goat god. Uh, which again is part of understanding what happened after the flood and before the flood with uh, with the giant creations and the and the and the angels that uh, didn't go to the the abyss prison. Some of them stayed, but if they were rebellious, they were probably degraded as well. So when you start to see some of those other angels, they're not going to do quite the same crimes as the first ones did, because I think they were either in fear of the consequence or there was uh, things put in that didn't permit them to do the things they did before that. Um, but things that probably get lifted as you go towards, as we get closer to the last seven years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, all right. Now, if you guys want to move, I mean, do you have anything else on the nights of, Pythias, or do you guys want to move on to maybe the Knights of Malta now or how they fit into the orders? Yeah, we can move on. Um, I did want to say one more thing that was interesting. Um, you know, as I've been starting to decode a lot of the city symbols and stuff, uh, especially Texas area, um, you know, as you come into some of those community areas, especially around where uh, the city council buildings are, I noticed the sigil that they chose uh, literally has Texas on an altar and they'll put that right on the threshing floors, you know, in the doorways, on the sides of buildings. And then, you know, in front of that, they'll put a fountain, they'll put lots of palm fronds and other, you know, Egyptian looking <laughs> plants around that. And when you see those type of areas, you know, pause, intercede pray know that in that area that's an area that the knights of pythias and the priestesses are using so mm. yeah. uh where it connects with malta is that you you get some of the you know you still have that greek connection um both of those groups financially in the brotherhood are considered um the Roman side of the system, you've, you've got two sides of the system. You have, you know, what's considered Rome, at, which is under the old Babylon system. That's the system that we're currently seeing, you know, destroyed, washed out. Uh, the other side is the Judas side, which is um, considered the Leviathan or the beast system. Uh, the, the old Babylon system is under the Vatican. So Knights of Pythias and, um, you know, a lot of those orders, Knights of Malta, they were all financially backed through the Vatican. And now that the Vatican has lost its money and its resources, which is why it was reaching out to the churches, demanding that they send money in uh, to them, um, we see that a lot of those knight orders, the military for the system are being switched over uh, under the financial backing of the Sanhedrin. Um, so that's the Judas side. Mm. Very interesting. Um, Gary, if you want to take over a little bit on the Knights of Malta. Sure. It's a, it's a, it, it is a, a big subject and, uh, 
Jesse had mentioned the uh, some of the different systems and system ages, I think, as she said in some past shows, and that we're moving into the Leviathan uh, system now. Um, and that is a worldwide sort of organizational thing. And if people are wondering, okay, we know Leviathan is in the Bible, but Jesse said something very important that this is the beast system. And when we're talking about the end time, we're talking about the dragon that comes out of the sea. It's the seventh empire, right? That has multiple heads like a hydra. Uh, and Leviathan comes out of the sea. It has multiple heads. So when the occult is talking about the Leviathan beast system, this is the end time system that they're, I think, we're referring to. So we have biblical references uh, that we can use to sort of decode some of the things uh, in terms of how they how they label it. Now, the Knights of St. John, um, they are way more powerful than people think they are. Um, and they're the oldest of the knight orders of the, let's say of the modern knight orders. They're actually created before the Templars. They actually come about in about 1040 or so, and they're building hospitals and things like that. That's where they get the hospital, hospitaller's name. And the other different names of like hospitaller, Knights of St. John, they're named after John the Baptist, even though they're Gnostic, they're not looking at John the Baptist as the same as we do, um, but as an Essene and all the other mythos that goes with that. Um, and then they have different names like Malta and Rhodes as they escape out of the Middle East and they keep getting chased, uh, then they change their name. But it's the same organization that was built. And all of the knight orders after the institu institu institutionalization of the Knights Templar and the organizational structure they have, all knight orders thereafter were modeled the same way. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the Knights Templar, the Teutonic Order, Knights of the Sepulchre. If they're called a Knight Order, they have a similar military order, just as you have the Jesuits who have a similar order as well. Uh, that were, you know, became known as the new Templars within the church and to do the same goals that the Templars were originally uh, uh, told to do. So... This organization today has sitting at the UN. Most people don't know that. They have the ability to vote. They have the ability to uh, participate in debates. There's only one other organization I know of, maybe there's others, but the only other one I know uh, that would have that kind of influence that isn't a nation state is CERN, and they would have similar rights. <laughs> yeah. And again, that's a whole different topic and show, but it shows you the power of the of of in the control they have over the world that the knights of saint john would have sitting capacity at the un and recognition at the at the un and so they're governed by elected princes of royal bloodlines now that's changed a little bit since the 90s but at the adept level nothing's changed still the same organization they're just making it a little bit i think more and jesse may know more about this than me they may i think they're just making it more palatable to the sort of modern world and the the adepts are, are more uh you know in the background and these are not usually the first sons so they are royals but usually the second third or fourth sons that are part of the the, the inner order, the senior order, as, 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 as I think they like to call it. And so this is an organization that has been heavily involved with the organizations of spy agencies because they're, they were very good at it, just as the Jesuits are part of that. So the CIA and all of the connections that the Bushes have to the CIA, this all comes from that same sort of knowledge base of, you know, cryptology and geomancy and, you know, codes and things like that. That's all part of that sort of history. So the Knights of St. John is uh, an order um, that... <clears throat> 
has links to the Templars. It has links to the Jesuits and they kind of work sort of hand in hand over the millennia in terms of shaping the world that we have today. So for example, um, in 1523, the Knights of St. John were defeated by Suleiman the Magnificent in Rhodes, right? And so they're kind of in a declining state. Uh, they're still in existence. But also in 1523, this is the, the time where Ignatius of Loyola begins his initiation within the Mary apparitions. That is no coincidence. It's a transference of... We need to have another organizational structure in the in the Catholic Church that's going to do the goals that we want. And that's to bring about from the, the Catholic Church perspective, a new Babylon, which is, again, part of that end time beast system that's going to work sort of jointly to, to together with them. And so you have also the Knights of St. John. They were venerating Mary. So the Mary apparitions, the Mary prophecies, whether it's Medjugorje, Fatima, Lourdes, uh, Joan of Arc, this is all part of that belief system and doctrine and part of what's going to be in the end time religion with that duality of the mother goddess coming back. Um, and you have a connection to the Knights Templar who magnified Mary Magdalene as a representative of Isis and the Queens of Heaven, right? And they dedicated all of the Gothic churches to Mary Magdalene, not Mary, Mother of Jesus. And you have another connection with the Knights of St. John to the banking system, that they've been heavily involved with banking throughout their history. But in a way that people don't always understand, it's been what you see from the visible side is kind of around the outer edges. But from the inside, you had um, the Knights of St. John. Uh, let me, and let me just back up a little bit. So in 1099, um, the Bullion king of Jerusalem, although he didn't have the official king title, Baldwin was the first one to have the title, but the leader of the Templar organization and of the senior organization at that time before they split into the senior and the junior, he grants the hospitalers their first endowment within Jerusalem. And so they start to get elevated and then they're going to receive a papal bull and get elevated more. Then they're going to have money that's poured into them. They're going to have to be incorporated and they're growing in power in parallel to the Knights Templar. And they're also training a lot of military people like the Templars. And with the Templars, uh, unlike the Templars, you have a lot of mercenaries that are working with the Knights of St. John. And some of these go back to Switzerland. And what's interesting about that is, is that um, through about in 1113, the Knights of St. John, you know, became um, a bull with papal bull. They became this large sort of organization, but then they set up in Switzerland in, before the Knights Templars were defeated in, in, in 1307 or, or dis, disbanded. So by 1180, a fellow by the name of Kuno von Buchesi, he's going to uh, donate a whole bunch of money to the Knights of St. John, and he's a crusader who's come back to Switzerland. And by 1187, seven years later, Knights of St. John in Switzerland opened their first priory. And in 1192, Bubacon becomes the chief commandery of the Knights of St. John. And what's interesting about 1187 and 1192 is, is 1187 was the fall of Jerusalem and the failure of the Templars. And in 1188, you have the splitting of the elm of the Priory of Sion from the Knights mm -hmm. Templar. So very important dates in history. But what's important here is that they are in Switzerland when the Knights Templars fall. 
So some of the money goes to and treasures goes to Scotland and over to the Sinclairs and a start up of Freemasonry. But some of it, the lands as in Spain and Portugal are going to be seized by the kings there. and They're going to set up new knight orders that are basically the Knights Templar just by a different name. And in Spain, the order is the Montessa order, which is really, really important because uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. But they are in Switzerland at the time of the fall of the Templars, and most of the French Templar wealth goes to Switzerland. And this is the beginning of the banking system in Switzerland. And so you have this uh, w white cross on this red field of blood red uh, of the of the of the Knights of St. John, that becomes the flag of Switzerland and the country of banking. Well, in 1307, after the fall of the Knights Templar, uh, the King of Spain, he forms the Montessa order and they're gonna inherit by 1317, all of the Spanish assets. Montessa order is the order that a fellow by the name of Francis Borgia, Borgia is gonna be grand master of and he's a descendant of the popes. He's got two popes. One's his grandfather in in Italy, and he's in Spain. And uh, Francis Francis is in uh, Spain, and he's the one who is going to bail Ignatius of Loyola out of prison uh, during the Inquisition, and then he's going to fund him, and then he's going to become the third grand master of the, of the Jesuits. So now you have a grand master of a royal bloodline and a, a, a Pope bloodline that is now uh, the grand master or the leader general of the Jesuits. And in 1572, Borgia moves the Vatican banking to the Knights of St. John banking in Switzerland. And of course the Rothschild banking in the last 20 or 30 years has moved to Switzerland. So now you have all of the world's major banking inside and outside the church centered in Switzerland. This is the power of the Knights of St. John. And they are they still very powerful within the Vatican church. One thing that has changed though, is since you have a black Pope who is the leader of the Jesuit order now in charge, and the Saint Knights of St. John used to be a separate order. They're now all under Pope Francis's rule and has basically kind of joined the two, as I understand it, uh, as, as doing the same biddings uh, for Francis. So Jesuits seem to be in control of the, the Knights of St. John right now. We'll see, have to, have to see how that sort of plays out. Uh, after Francis might be, you know, after he dies, let's say, we'll see whether or not that continues. Right. But this sort of gives you the picture that they're they're involved in the Crusades. They're involved throughout all of history, throughout the Mediterranean. They're involved throughout that period of time since the creation with the Vatican Church doing the Vatican will, and they're run by blood royale. So you have to understand that they're probably working in similar sort of directions at the top. And they're involved in the banking, and they're all involved in the merry apparitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, Francis has recognized the Medjugorje visions. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. And now Medjugorje is under Vatican control. And one should expect that this is going to have a major influence with the, with the rise of Babylon. And keep in mind that the Jesuits as the new Templar uh, inherited the goal of the Templars to create the new Babylon, the new Babylon system of the end time that includes the religious aspect that's part of the Leviathan system. Mm-hmm. And that female influence is really is really brought out um, where that stems even farther back is that, you know, you kind of have a trio in scripture uh, as Israel is coming out of the land of Egypt. Um, you have Moses, who the Lord called as a prophet. You have his brother Aaron, who the Lord called as the priest. And then you have their sister Miriam. And, you know, that that imagery of, of a woman who's able to, you know, enter into the sacred place, into the presence of God, 
uh, was carried out um, or carried forward, uh, where then we see, you know, kind of that same imagery put on Mary Magdalene, um, you know, where they proclaim that same favor of God over her. And that's where the line of seraphical priestesses comes from, where, you know, on the Judas side with the Sanhedrin, you have that group of priestesses that, you know, are specially trained to serve in the temple, um, you know, and, and their job very much is to be involved with those end time things. Uh, to the extent that, you know, some of them have been in charge of setting up, um, you know, things that are happening within the Temple of Israel right now. So. Okay. So it's it's interesting, too, because if you guys look up the notable members of the Knights of Malta, uh, like Gary was saying, and um, these are higher up and these are like bishops, uh, princes. Uh, Juan Carlos uh, of Spain. I mean, there's a lot of higher ups and then also central intelligence. They can also make their own passports. I think that's the only secret, only secret society I've ever seen that can make their own passports totally yeah. in charge of, uh, you know, like Gary said, of, of being spies, uh, intelligence, uh, M M6, um, a lot of that in there, a lot of like Royal, um, people the the Hathbergs, uh some people that gary's mentioned on our show um a lot of um uh like i said a lot of princes a lot of archdukes there's just a ton of people on these lists and there's americans as well if you want to look up like presidents that have joined and stuff like that but there's a lot higher power here than if you look up like you know i was telling you about the knights of pythias i'm like oh roosevelt like that's that's a big deal to us in america but these people are like are powerful that are in the Knights of Malta. They're not just like a president, which we think is so powerful, but they're really nothing. They're just puppets, you know? So I think that gets really interesting. If you guys want to look it up yourselves, it's it's going to take you all day to look into all these people, but it gets interesting. Just look up the notable members of Knights of Malta. Uh, if you guys want to check out that and um, do a deep dive, you'll it'll blow your mind. It's like going through the bloodlines. It's just it's mind boggling. I've done it before on our last show for this. So <laughs> I thought it's interesting. So Gary, if you'd like to go anymore or, or Jesse, if you guys have anything else on the, the Knights of Malta, I think you guys did an excellent job so far. It's been an amazing show. Yeah. Definitely. So the Knights of St. John, they started the Mary worship. They started venerating using that as what this changed the nomenclature to, to Mary, Joseph yep. and, or Mary and uh, Jesus from yeah what? yeah no they weren't the they weren't the um genesis to it uh, about 1565 they uh accredited a victory over the Turks um at Malta uh to Mary's intercession so that's when they start to have their own Marian uh, spirituality and they have their own statues to Mary and, and, and things like that. So Joan of Arc actually predates that in terms of her Mary app apparition, but it's all sort of heavily involved to the, to the French bloodlines and what's, what's, what's going on there. Um, so the Mary apparitions, yeah, I would say the earliest dating that, that I would have of it would be uh, with, with Joan of Arc but there was this sort of long sort of within the Catholic church of raising Mary to um, almost godhood through several centuries uh, that was sort of building towards this. And that whole concept, um, whether it was for good or, or for evil intents, uh, I'll let people decide that on their own, has been uh, captured by the polytheists and they're going to use that mary apparition but not as we would understand mary it would be like the queen of heaven that they're referencing and so the description whether it's in um visions that happened in mexico or visions that happened at lords or wherever you have it they have a very similar description of who this looks like and it's described and and i can't 
say it more clearly than the Medjugorje vision, where they give very clear descriptions, but they also say she is described as the woman in Revelation 12. And that's the counterfeit. Um, because this queen of heaven that is initiating false prophets that will hit uh, the world at us on certain set dates that they've already laid down. Uh, and you've had apparitions all over the world. So expect initiated false prophets from all over the world from these apparitions to hit. This is not the woman that's pictured in Revelation 12. They're just stealing that, usurping that imagery and overlaying it on. And it's it's some sort of fallen angel um, who is like Sophia in their um in the, in the Gnostic religion. And she's the mother of the 12 archons that includes the God of the Bible and Satan because they're equal. Right. And that she formed these through this nebulous, some sort of nebulous uh, copulation with this life force. And they created these 12 archons. And so you're going to see this mother goddess aspect come back uh, and be front and center, not only through the Mary apparitions and through the Catholic Church, uh, as it usurps the Catholic Church completely, um, but that it is a centerpiece to the upper worship of the secret societies, that they have the female goddess that, some in from what I've been told, is, is at times considered superior to the male god. And so you have... Uh, these images like the hive and their imageries with that, with the queen bee, that's like Sophia. That's the divine essence that they're going to receive all of this knowledge from and interdimensional knowledge that again, we won't go into today, but it's, it's going to all come together. And there seems to be a connection to that, to the Leviathan empire that they want to bring that mother goddess back somehow, some way. Um, perhaps out of the abyss um, when the abyss prison opens up you know in isaiah 25 i think it is but the book of isaiah you have uh, the leviathan that's going to be slain in the end time but we have a female leviathan that was slain in prehistory and that's a that's a torah story that's told all around the world whether or not it's uh, tiamat out of the sumerian pantheon uh, and she has all of these different names all over the world. And so this is part of that whole Leviathan system that's coming back. There's another interesting passage that the uh, Antichrist is going to honor in secret, uh, a god of forces. And this word god doesn't go back to El or Elohim, as in multiple gods, single uh, lowercase. It's Eloah. And that's really interesting because that's the female vo version of Elohim. Yeah. And, could you, could and you usually all... used in, oh, sorry. And usually in Hebrew to, to be describing power and how, and, and knowledge and how that might be used. But it's interesting that the God that he's worshiping in, in secret has a female Hebrew word as opposed to El. Okay. Yeah. Mason, go ahead. What were we going to say? Oh, I was going to say, like, you can date this all the way back to Nimrod's wife, right? Uh, Sim, yeah, I was going to bring Sim it up. Because when they confound, yeah, when they confound the languages, they split them all up. And then Isis, Ishtar, uh, mm -hmm. Venus. Um, when, now now it's all Mar uh, Mary, but she was she was the leader of the religion while you are. And Nimrod went away and fought. So I always wondered, how does she, how did it spread so fast? Like, how does her. What did she learn? Like, what is she? Is she? Uh, is she a god, or is is an actual woman that was actually very, very smart on the scripture, but also, um, uh, well, Nimrod. I don't. I don't know if he was a uh, if he was a uh, Nephilim or not, but it, should, it could be. Book of Jasher. I think the Book of Jasher says says that, but I, I, I think I don't know. Like, I heard, I heard, giant, a, I heard. A, it says I heard he a became. A, it says he became a giant. Basically, it didn't say like. He didn't say he was born a giant, but it said he became a giant. But you can look at it as he became a warrior. There's different ways Might to interpret been. that. Yeah. So I don't want to say that he's a, a Nephilim 100%. The Bible doesn't say it, but if you get. Um, but you have Gilgamesh. Gary, and, Gary, and Gary would probably have a better idea of that. Or Jesse, what do you guys think about that? 
Well, the actual wording uses became a mighty one, which is the Hebrew word gibber or gibberim in the plural. Yeah. Uh, so a gibberim can be used to describe a giant, but not in all cases. It shows up, I think, 154 times in the Old Testament, sometimes to describe a giant, but it can also just be used to describe the might. So yeah. Excel goes back to gibor. Uh, describing angels or the strength of God is used as Gubor. So you have to be careful with that. He has a human father, but he could have had a, uh, you know, Cush could have married a fallen angel, but we're not told that. So, we're, and he's not described as a Raphaim or a Nephilim. So I think we want to be careful with that. But I think what is safe is, is who more safer to speculate on is who was his wife? Now, was that a giant or was that a fallen angel? And did he produce offspring with that? Uh, wow. And my my gut feeling is as likely he married a giant um, because he's not considered as pure as the Aryans or the other races uh, of, of the East. Uh, and I think he intermarried into that. So I think he's legitimately, and he's in the table of nations. So he's, he wouldn't be listed in the table of nations if he was a giant. So Rafa is not listed. Arba is not listed. Any of the patriarchs of the nine patriarchless Canaanites aren't listed. So I'd say Cush was human, he became a mighty one, but we don't know what that means. That's the Hebrew word chalal. It means to break your vow. Uh, so he does something to maybe swear an oath and apply the occult sciences, and maybe he becomes stronger using some of that knowledge. Um, but he's 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 kind of unique. But he's I don't think he's a giant. But but the wife could be uh, considered a giant, or maybe it was. A, uh, a, 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 a an fallen angel, angel a fallen angel of some sort typically though what happens is the wives and the and, and the males are on the thrones they assume goddess and god titles but as representatives with the divine right to rule that's provided to them which is probably more likely yeah. but i would think semiramis was a giant interesting Okay, and uh, yes. guys, just to let you know too. Uh, King Charles is also uh, he's a uh, he's a knight of Malta as well. If you guys are interested in that, um. So, well, thank you guys. Is yeah, that, well, yeah. The, yeah, he is, and and just as Queen Elizabeth was, uh, the, the queen of Malta, was the right? leader of that, but yes. uh, yeah, and because they they ruled over there, so from the Protestant side, they control that. And they would have influence on the Catholic side as well because of their bloodlines. Queen Elizabeth was also um, part of the Order of the Golden Fleece of the uh, Habsburg, Habsburg Lorraine dynasty, and that the Bourbons have a rival one as well. And so one would, would expect King Charles III would be also sitting on those royals as well even though they have their own royal Order order. It's not un yeah. yeah so it's not yeah. unusual that they would sit on other masonic royal bloodline orders very interesting um i right. thank you that was like a a perfect brief uh on the knights of malta um jesse did you have anything to to, to add to that before we before we exit um, no, I think, I mean, I think that's probably as thorough as we're going to get in a short period of time. <laughs> yes, I thought so too. Um, I always Excellent. say this, I always say this, uh, any last words for our audience before, before we go, we'll start with you, Jesse, since you're, since you're already talking, you know, if, if you want to just tell them anything, uh, you know, anything you want to tell them, you know, as far as leading them to God or, or, or what to look out for or what to prepare for anything of the sort. Yeah, I think, you know, I think as we talk about these things, a lot of uh, people who listen many times will kind of be fearful. And I, I was really glad the way the conversation went. And I love when, you know, Gary's on there talking because it, I think the knowledge is what makes us feel like we have more control over the things that we don't have control over. And really when we understand how things work and operate, it kind of gives us more of that peace um, you know, but I just encourage people be in the word more, 
uh, look into these things, research, ask the Lord to, to reveal, you know, how the enemy is operating because we're not powerless. Um, the Lord has given us his full measure of authority. And that's what I want to leave people with is that, you know, we don't need to be fearful of those that are ruling. We don't need to be fearful of the Leviathan system coming in at the end of the day. Um, you know, we have a God who sovereignly is in control and he, you know, as sons and daughters of the living God, he's given us his full authority to rule and to reign with him. Um, you know, I talk a lot about that on kingdom living with um, the authority that we have in the Lord and what that looks like, uh, to really be in that place where we're operating out of that authority. So I encourage people to look into that. And, um, you know, don't let fear rule your heart. Perfect. Uh, and Gary, any last words for our audience? Yeah. So secret societies are an oath-based organization and they swear oaths. And biblically, we're told you're going to be held accountable to oaths. We're told not to swear oaths. Um, we you know, I doubt whether unless we cross the line, like with an oath with the mark of the beast system at the implementation that um, it's not going to be forgiven, but you will be held accountable. And their oaths that they swear um, is a long tradition of their organizational structure that they bind themselves to. Um, it's uh, age old and the oath system is the same thing that King Charles III, if people are watching his coronation, it was a shortened form of the ancient uh, coronation, but he swears an oath and he swears an oath to a specific God, not the God of the Bible, but the, the God that is uh, he reports to in, in the whole hierarchy as part of the divine right to rule that he's being given from the Balim, as we would understand it from the Balim Council or the Council of Gods of Psalms 82, uh, to rule on earth to represent uh, specific gods within that assembly. And so it could be part of his genealogies, whether they're Sion Din or the original patriarch of a, of a Raphaim or a Nephilim, and then back to specific angels. And that this is a system that I think goes back to, and maybe even before this, to the 200 on Mount Hermon who swore the oath of Haram and Athema to carry it out to the end, no matter the consequences. And that what they proceeded to do thereafter was to create the giants to try and destroy or lead humankind so far away from God that they would be obliterated and not reach their destiny, that they would be remembered no more, just as the giants tried to do with Israel when they came out of Egypt. And so the, the whole process of the oath based system is, is to lead people away from God and get control over you. They use these oaths to get sort of legal sort of uh, hold of you and if we don't think that those things have consequences or legality to it i would remind people of moses who uh, was born an israelite was raised in the pharaonic uh, society and and family was educated at heliopolis would have been an adept and a magi of very very high levels swore oaths to that pantheon um and this was part of god's plan to him to learn that probably to be able to address the egyptians and the language and the nuances that were going to be needed to free israel but when moses died who showed up satan he was there to make his claim and except for God sending Michael, because Moses was doing God's bidding, even when he was learning the inside workings of the Pharaonic society, God trumped that oath. He has the ability to do that. But there's a, there's a point where those things don't get forgiven. And that begins with the sins against the Holy Spirit and 
crimes against creation. So mm -hmm. we have to be aware of that, that these things have legitimacy and we live in an oath based world. And they use that to, for control and power. And we need to understand that. And we need to be able to deal with that because uh, we live in their world. I mean, everything is controlled by them. We just don't, most people just don't get it. Um, and it's designed to lead us away from God and into destruction. So that's what I would leave uh, people with is, is uh, what we're talking about, why it's important to understand these, the secret societies. And then one last point is, is that, I get asked a lot, do you actually believe all that, that these secret societies and the bloodlines say and do? And, and I say, you know, it's irrelevant what I believe. What's important is, is they believe it and what they do with that belief system. Mm -hmm. And that belief system does not have our betterment in mind. And we need to understand that. Yes. Amen to that. And Jason, any last words? This, uh, like they said, when you study the Bible, it mentioned it, it does mention a lot of this stuff in the Bible. So, religion, uh, Catholicism, uh, any, any, any type of religion you get into, you understand it's not about that, it's about relationship with God. And when you read the Bible, you get a better understanding of like what's going on. If you notice how the, how this, this world is going, it's, kicking the the father out is kicking the man out and it's bringing more of a feminine into this world and more femininity into the men and you're you're seeing it to where like you said the 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 woman uh that rides the beast is, is, is kind of coming through right now that that system is coming through to where they, that's an abomination it's a total abomination so watch what you do watch watch who do you pray to pray to and just understand that there's only one intercessor to god and that's that's his son. And it's not Mary. It's not, it's not St. Joe. It's not St. Anything. It's nobody. They, Mary can't hear you because she's, she's not going to pray for you. She's not, she's, she's not here. She's dead. So okay. she, she's not, I'm innocent. She can't be everywhere. There's, I know I understand the apparition and stuff like that, but that stuff is sent to you, to people so that it can spread and be more, more prominent in their life. So don't, uh, don't believe everything you hear, but also do your own studies and and be your uh, be very very wise about what you what you uh, pray to and worship. Yes, amen to that. Yeah, and make sure, guys. Uh, we're talking about spiritual warfare here. We're talking about how these people are trying to rule over us, but you know the only one that has authority over us is God, uh, Jesus Christ. That's who we. Uh, that's who we are, are um, that's where we are pointed to, that's who we are worshiping. So I'll give you a few scriptures. Um, so 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, it says, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. You could say protect you from the e evil ones as well, the demons, the fallen angels, uh, these principalities of evil. Okay, so uh, 2, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, it says, The weapons we fight with, are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we will take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Okay, so uh, James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The, the word flee there is he will run from you. Okay, so let's submit ourselves to God and resist the devil. Um, the, the main thing I want to say here is that, that God is in control. we live by God's will and know that he has power over God created everything. Okay. He has power over heaven, the keys to heaven, the keys to hell and the keys to the earth, the demons, the, the devils, all that stuff. They, they don't have power like that. So who do you want to be with the one that wins in the end, God, or do you want to be with these, these get thrown into a lake of fire with, with the antichrist, the false prophet and the demons and fallen angels and Satan. Okay. Just, just know that, okay, who you should choose. So God wins. So I just want to let you guys know I appreciate Jesse. I appreciate Gary. I appreciate Jason uh, taking your time out tonight. Jesse, I mean, you are a soldier for sure because it is like probably 12 o'clock there or 1 o'clock in the morning. Thank you for that. Gary, thank you. I know you're taking time out from your summer stay. 
Uh, you know, I appreciate you so much and I really love you guys. This show right here, I think it's very important, vastly important that you guys work well together. Hopefully we can have another show in the future. Gary, I don't know when you're going to be back. Um, we're going to Thailand. I am going to Thailand for about three weeks. So uh, maybe October or November, we'll set another show up if you guys are okay with that. Um, I think you guys work very well together. I think you did an amazing job and I, I appreciate you. Um, so we're going to end this. Yeah, we're going to end this in prayer like we always do. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for for uh, all the research that you have uh, Jesse and Gary doing on these secret societies. I know that um, they are conspiracy and Christianity. You know that they're, they're trying to lead people to you, Lord. And that's amazing. And I thank you for blessing us with these two individuals on the podcast. Thank you for blessing us with this show. Lord, I ask that you please protect us from these people trying to rule over us in the towns and the different regions and the different states, the different countries. We just want to ask that you just protect us. I know that you already do protect us, but put a legion of angels around us. Put a legion of angels around Gary and Jesse. I know they're trying to yes, um, expose the evil, right? Like you say in Ephesians, expose the evil. And, and also we want all these secrets are going to be are going to be yelled from the highest uh, house. Uh, you know, there are, all these secrets are going to be told. These people might think they're in secret doing all this, you know, rituals and killing children and doing all this stuff, but it's all going to be let out. And we want to let these people know that you are in charge. Everybody that's listening that is on the fence, Lord, please supernaturally bring them to you. Help them to get closer to you. Um, bless the books that, uh, that that Jesse and Gary have written, you know, and um, and then help people you know, read these books, but also guys, the most important book is sitting on your nightstand. It's the Holy Bible, Lord. So help them to read that book. That is the most important. So thank you, God. We appreciate you in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Mm. Everybody listening, please follow uh, Gary Wayne's YouTube. Uh, Jesse, follow, follow, go to her website, check out her books. Jesse, do you have an Instagram? Um, Not that I use, no. Okay. Uh, Mostly Gary on Twitter. Twitter is the main platform I'm on. Okay, so if you could shout out your Twitter, shout out anything to get a hold of you guys before yeah, we end. Voter Jesse and then Patreon.com. Perfect. And Gary, any way to get a hold? I guess Genesis Six Conspiracy.com. <laughs> yes, and at Gary Wayne on Twitter and also Gary Wayne on Facebook. Yes, I do have an Instagram uh, account. I can't say I use it a lot, but I do have it. Um, I may be starting to use some more formats as we go forward, but uh, those are the main ones. Uh, Messenger is also good on, on Facebook as well to get a hold of me. Perfect. All right. And everybody that's listening, please share the show. Please subscribe. Uh, it really helps us out. And please leave comments below. Let us know, you know what we could do to better the podcast. Also, comment below if you have any questions. And I'll try to get a hold of Jesse and Gary to answer those questions. God bless you guys. Thank you.